do that, your, your ability to be prime, your ability to be integral, your ability to be important elevates, but you're doing it from such a beautiful, humble way. You're not on a pedestal, right? You're just sitting at the table Laying the, laying the table. So what are the communities you could begin to create? Now, I want to take one other aspect of community. We wrote a book, and I'll talk about it in a bit. We wrote a book called Who's Got Your Back after I wrote Never, uh, Never Eat Alone. Because I had studied networks and relationships, and I said, well, what about, what about the tight relationships? Not the broad relationships, but what about the tight ones? And what I found was that in America, this was about 15 years ago, and I don't think it's changed. In America... 50% of Americans say that no one has my back. Being, having somebody have your back is defined as who is out there being deeply generous, worrying about you when, you know, when you're not around. Who out there will tell you the truth when you don't want to hear it? Who out there uh, can you be fully vulnerable and transparent with it and truly tell everything to? Right? Who out there truly has your back? 50% said, no one has my back. Of those who said, no one has my back, 60% were married. I'm not Dr. Phil, so we're not going to have that conversation. But you can imagine, this is to that point of the most important relationships in your life. How invested are you fully in that human and their full elevation? What that means to them and where they're going the hopes, the aspirations, the fears, and how much do they feel that you fully, truly have your back? You may be blessed to have that relationship. I, at the time when I wrote this book, I was in a relationship that, didn't, that I, we did not have each other's back. And I made a commitment that I would never get into another relationship until it was co-elevating. Um, but what I, my invitation to you is to live your life with that being the hurdle of primacy of what a relationship is. Not handshaking, backslapping, relationships that are basically transactional. But what would your life be look, look like if you were the person that walked around the world and people said, this, this person has my back? And all of the nuances of benefit that could accrue to you and your organization and your family, etc. cetera. Um, let me talk a little bit about community. You know, most of you or many of you are in the multifamily housing business. And I thought about that for a second, and it certainly isn't my specialty, and I'm, I would get in trouble to pretend like I know your business and what matters. But I can't say there's been something that I've been worrying about for a long time, just thinking about it personally, which is community and housing in my own right. So I told you I have six boys, and my house is sort of like a compound. Um, my boys are between the ages of uh, mid-20s and to mid-30s. And with those individuals, there's always somebody living at our house, which is great because Sunday we always have family dinners. And family dinners is when they and their girlfriends or they and their spouses come to the house. And my dream is that over time, our home becomes a compound. It becomes a place where everybody has in the neighborhood has their own independent living places and their own privacy, etc. <coughs> but our chef, our house our entertainment centers, all of those things become the place where people commune and convene. Now, this is sort of like kibbutz living in a sense, if you think about it. Now, if I, if I look at the data point of 50% of Americans say that no one has their back, and we all know the statistics of loneliness and isolation and divisiveness that are going on in the world, and you ask people whether they know their neighbors or they don't know their neighbors, and you ask yourself, what is your responsibility in helping bring community to the people who are signing a lease. My suspicion that's not just a community room or a shared dining thing, and it's probably not just having three parties a year that you host that feel like events. And I start, the word comes up to me, I call it real estate baiting. Um, I see it going on in office buildings all over the world today where people are giving better lunches and they're thinking about re-engineering their office space for cooler looking space, etc. But at the end of the day, these people come into the office and they're sitting there on their Zoom calls just like they were when they were at home. Where would you rather be? Right? And so it's not a surprise that if you just throw these transactional elements at people, but what would it mean for you to engineer community in your properties? Now, there's a crazy person that we've all watched television about, Andrew Newman. Is that Andrew? Is, um, Adam Newman, who did WeWork who was born in a kibbutz, which gave him insight or ideas about 
we work, and now he's creating residential housing. Um, I don't know if he'll be successful or not, but a buddy of mine just went to work as his chief marketing officer. And I think there's something there. And I think it could be game-changing for society and the world. Um, and interestingly enough, the difference between you hosting events and you providing physical space, that's not what you should be engineering. Similarly, in your own offices, just hosting better lunches and providing better chairs or sofas is not what you should be engineering for. What you should be engineering for is when people come together, do they care? Do they co-elevate? Do they bond? Do they connect? Your job is to re-engineer co-elevation, not re-engineer transaction. And it's interesting, I've been studying the creation of community for many, many years. And when I was in Israel many years ago, I asked myself a simple question, having been brought up as a Christian, I asked myself, how did one dude pull this off? I mean, we're talking about a massive institution. You know, maybe he had a little help, but, you know, how did one dude pull this off? And I realized, wait, one person didn't, 12 did. What does it mean to build community as 12. But even then, I was like, how did they do it? I went back and researched, and what I found was that the 12 disciples at the point of Christ's death, they went around the community, and what they set up was a model where women would host small groups of five women in their living rooms on Sundays. And that became the birthplace of the church. And those women were coached when they would start to have this small group of five what they would be coached to do would be to birth those other women doing the same thing in their homes. So the idea would be you'd create a small enough group of five, you'd create bonding, loyalty, the women would serve each other, they'd talk about what really matters to them in their life and the struggles and the challenges that they were having in their lives, and then they would be encouraged to go start their own communities in their own living rooms. That's called snowflake leadership. It's at the core of how the Baptist faith creates, and most of the big churches get created when I was... Looking at big church management, I would talk to some of these mega church leaders and I'd say, how do, you, how do you grow your church base? And what they would say was, we grow our church base in groups of six. It's the women's quilting group. It's the women's grieving group. 